Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. All right, let's see. We're going to go back in time with our next story. It's, yes. it's fiction, but it's a biography, right? So it's a historical fiction. Is yes. that how I say this? Uh-huh. Uh, Eleanor Cripps is on the phone. She is an historian. She is fluent in more languages than me, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> the only one I know is English, but she can speak French and Italian. She's a lecturer about Hinayana Buddhism. Am I saying that right? Hinayana? Mm-hmm. Uh, she worked as a uh, tri... I can't even speak English, <laughs> let alone the other. Well, you speak Pig Latin. She, I can do Pig Latin. You she, do a good job. She worked as a trilingular secretary for an international team of engineers. She's a delegate for the German Trade Information Service. And uh, her book is called, this I can do, The Countess Choir Woman. It's an historical novel. And it is also doing really well on Amazon. I just looked it up real quickly. Uh, Eleanor Cripps, it's an honor to have you on our show. Good morning, Eleanor. Thank you, and good morning. And I appreciate very much being on your show. And where are you calling from? Uh, well, I'm a little envious of your 75 degrees because <laughs> I'm in Falls Church, Virginia, which is just uh, five miles from D.C. And we have about uh, not quite 40 degrees. Do you have any snow? No. No, no snow. Okay. We had a few flakes a couple of days ago, <laughs> but uh, that's all. So your so your story goes back to what year? Well, uh, really it begins with the birth of my um, heroine, uh, which was in 1730. But it's uh, an 18th century story of um, uh, a woman who... Just 12 years old, when was just 12 years old when she and her teenage siblings had to leave their home and family in the mountains of Transylvania, which was then still part of Hungary, now belongs to Romania, mm-hmm. to relocate to Vienna and the house of a cardinal. Oh, okay. Is this somebody you are related to? No, it is not. No, okay. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, did you know her personally? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, knew, I didn't think you knew I'm her personally. <laughs> but it's a, is it a biography? Is it based on somebody real? Yes. Oh, okay. uh, I attended a class reunion in my hometown in Leoben, Austria. I was born in Vienna, but this is in the central part of Austria, in the province of Styria when uh, one of my classmates had arranged uh, a tour of the location of the nearby former Abbey of Gers. But I picked up a little uh, booklet written by a historian that dedicated just a couple of pages to uh, the unique story of uh, this one choir woman that was truly unique in the 800-year history of the Abbey. Okay. I was so touched by what she endured that I decided to research it. All right, that's where we want to go. First, tell me her name. Is it Maria? Well, she was Marie Therese, and her her um, nickname as a child was Tessa. But when uh, women become uh, choir women or nuns, for that uh, for that matter. Certainly, at that time, they received a totally new name, which was always preceded by Maria. Oh, so she really? Maria Colomba. Oh, I didn't know Every they did that. Every woman of the Abbey had the name of Maria, and then her other name. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so so did you know all of the the historical? facts. Did you know them before starting to write this book or the, well, as the, st- the I certain Go ahead. Sorry. I certainly researched but uh, originally there was very little available uh, except her basic data, family background, her great love for the Gregorian chant and what happened to her at the Abbey. Ah. I was grateful to my dear friend Ruth, a high school friend who was able to locate uh, publications by the uh, Bavarian Benedictine Academy. Uh, She was, of course, belonged to the Order of the Benedictines. And uh, this this booklet contained the names, the data, and even the background of all my major characters. Oh, wow. Uh, Wow. 
and also it is of course a novel, an historic novel, but uh, the major characters are all were all two persons, and their data are correct. So what happened to Tessa? What what was she? Did she? Did her life turn completely upside down when she had to move to Vienna? Yes. She uh, was raised uh, in a country, comfortable country estate in the Transylvania mountains with her uh, three older siblings. When she lost her father and her mother, who was faced with uh, severe uh, financial problems, uh, I could only imagine that she was overwhelmed and accepted the offer of her closest relative, uh, an uncle who was a cardinal uh, in Vienna, to assume responsibility for her four children. So in the book, the, the siblings were uh, separated. Yes. Uh, they all, within a year, converted to Catholicism. And uh, the boys were sent to the Abbey of Melk, which is a magnificent Benedictine Abbey uh, at the, uh, on the Danube. Uh, their, their older girl, uh, who always loved to was always loved teaching and wanted to be a teacher. She joined the Ursuline Order in the city of Graz, which is also in the in Styria. Uh, they were they are uh, dedicated to teaching uh, poor children. Obviously, a large part of the population at that time was illiterate. And Tessa, the youngest, who had who was extremely musically talented, especially singing. She was sent to the Abbey of Gus, which is an abbey of choir women, uh, to, which she welcomed because she was most unhappy in the city of uh, uh, Vienna and was so glad when she heard that Gus was located among wooded mountains. Oh, okay. So she she learned to love the place that may not have been so lovely if she if it weren't for some of those things. Well, of course, she didn't know at the time uh, that uh, cloistered uh, contemplative orders cannot leave the walls of uh, their convent. However, it was still a great, may I say, improvement from being in the city, which she just hated. She was not used to it. And you also have to uh, consider that in the 18th century, uh, Vienna was a very, very crowded city, which to some extent the inner city still is. But at that time, it was much worse. Well, she did more than singing, though. I mean, everybody in the convent, they had to work and they had a very, very difficult working hours. Well, uh, she did not work. She was a choir woman, uh, a noble woman, and there was there were Benedictine nuns who were so-called lay nuns, but they were of course also under the under the vows, uh, final vows. Um, but they uh, performed the services. The choir women hardly had any time. If you can imagine, starting at midnight, they sang seven sung lengthy services, so they had very little time left, starting at midnight, continuing at 5, 8, 9, it went oh my through the day until after 5 o'clock. Okay, so I'm, try I'm trying to uh, understand what her life was like, and if I use the word slave, forgive me if it's wrong, but was she kind of, uh, is she, she's held against her will, it sounds like. Um, I mean, singing sounds well, like a beautiful thing, but I mean, if you're forced to sing for that much time, it... Um, is, is there well, a uh, you are you are thinking? Pardon me, but you're thinking like a 21st century. Oh, okay. Which I don't blame you for. Yeah. But there were many, many religious orders. Uh, only the only some were cloistered, contemplative orders. But uh, she had very little choices. As a young woman, uh, who with a very limited dowry. And women at that time, their marriages were arranged. And as the older girl frequently expresses, I would much rather be a nun than to be forced into marrying a man I don't like. Yeah, right. I don't blame her. You have to always <laughs> consider the alternative. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and did they have that choice that they could marry or not? 
Well, uh, no, not really, because no. obviously uh, a Catholic cardinal, and this shouldn't be held against him, because that was just the time. Uh -huh, he uh -huh. thought that was by far the best for them. His alternative would have been to arrange marriages for them. Unfortunately, uh, the, their father, their late father, had two brothers who lived in Vienna, counts, but they wanted nothing to do with the children. They had children of their own, and they thought uh, the bishop was the best man to take care of them. If the family had been willing to take them in, yes, they certainly had that alternative. But uh, don't blame it on the on the bishop cardinal, because the family, I think, uh, is more guilty. But she, but you wrote in the book that sometimes she did not like what was happening. No, of course, uh, few of us do. Uh, she <laughs> was as a as a convert. Um, she was from from Protest from being a Protestant and having a very small uh, dowry. Uh, many of the others who came from much much wealthier families. Uh, considered her somewhat inferior. She also sang much better than any of the others, and there's always jealousy. Let's face it, mm -hmm. women like to be yes. <laughs> jealous. <laughs> and uh, she, they had cliques, and uh, she also, unfortunately, and that was one of her uh, not-so-great qualities, she had a fierce temper. And when she was provoked, uh, she would sometimes react in ways that were not really acceptable for uh, a Benedictine nun. It sounds like you've really done a lot of research and the reader is going to learn a lot about that time period. It, it also seems like you have um, s some strong convictions about God yourself. Am I right about that? Yes, I do. Yeah. I do because I, I love history. I'm a, a lay student of history, and I know that when you write or when you read about a different time, you cannot repeat, not compare it with the present time. Mm -hmm. Which is what I was doing. Uh, yes, and I, I, I know some friends who read the book said, how couldn't the cardinal uh, send them out and uh, give them choices? Well, he was a cardinal of the Catholic Church of the 18th century, he considered it his moral duty so to send them to religious institutions. So I don't mean to jump too far ahead, but tell me about Joseph II. What, what, what was his role in her life? Well, it was a dramatic role because as a contemplative order, Joseph II uh, was anxious to acquire the properties of these orders. He considered them useless, and so he dissolved them by fiat. And uh, um, the choir women suddenly were private citizens, and he, they were forced to live on a ridiculously low stipend, yearly stipend. Hmm. Only Maria Colomba was granted a much higher amount because of her imprisonment, uh, which infringed upon, even upon the rules of St. Benedict, the con convent rules, uh, and the order, rules of the order were infringed upon, and also against an edict by the late Maria Teresa, who said nobody can be held a prisoner, uh, I mean, in a, within a convent. So she receives a much uh, higher stipend. So but she is... So what, what, what warranted her to be put in prison? Well, she lost her temper, and it comes to a dramatic scene when she decides to preserve or, or uh, seeks to preserve the uh, medieval frescoes of, uh, the, uh, of the Gothic chapel in the abbey. And she really behaves out of bounds, but her her temperament goes through with her, and uh, her, her, um, the convent of Peers, her sisters, uh, decide she is guilty, and uh, the prioress, who is second to the abbess, but is in charge of uh, deciding on penalties, uh, names a penalty that she considers totally um, indig undignified and unjust, and so she rather decides to spend her time in the Camera Correcciones or the 
the correction chamber, which was virtually a prison cell. You know, this is such a developed character. Um, it's it's almost unusual for a fictional character to be so developed. You really put a lot into this, um, and it sounds like it's it's the, all the characters in the book have this rich background that you've you've developed. Did that make writing the book? Take, did it take longer than, than normally a novel might, or did it take more research on your part? Well, somewhere it says that it took me 10 years, but it didn't. Uh, but I wrote it several years ago, and uh, asked a few agents, uh, literary agents, and none of them wanted to have anything to do with the story of a nun until I saw an ad of the, uh, uh, oh, well, the Catholic, uh, not not Catholic, but uh, the Christian faith publishing, and uh, so I sent them a manuscript, and I had a contract within a week. Oh my gosh! So they got it, and and that 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 really does illustrate the difference between uh, one publisher and another, because a lot of them are afraid to to uh, go into an area that might be considered, I guess, religious, right? Yes, yeah. well, it's both religious and and secular because I think both play a role. Well, and I, and but isn't that the way all of our lives are? We, I mean, everybody who thinks, That's right. I mean, if you have a, if you if you don't believe in God at all, then I guess it's not true for you. But for most of us, you, know, you live your life. You have to drive. You have to stop at a red light like everybody else, putting it into the twenty first century. Mm-hmm. You know, but you still believe in God. You might be praying while you're at that light, right? So yeah. So yes, I, I certainly do. <laughs> oh, me too. So what? So, so what was? Did she have anything that made her question her faith? Well, she questioned it only later. She did not originally, and she did not really question her faith ever. She just questioned uh, what some of her of what some people did to her. Okay. W- w- and and was her well was her trying to save the frescoes? I mean that you know those are her works of art. Oh, they are fantastic works of art, and it took it only in the nineteenth century where they recovered. They were ordered by the prioress to be painted over with chalk, and this upset her so much. They were, of course, the frescoes were all of the Old Testament, mm-hmm. and there was a time in the church. In, in all Christian uh, churches, that uh, uh, the uh, the Bible, the, uh, the Old Testament, was considered somewhat immoral. Now, these frescoes were by no means immoral, but they were carefully, carefully re, uh, recovered or reinstated, and uh, I saw them, I of course saw them, and I think they are just beautiful. Mm. Wow. Wow. And that is... Uh, and, and again, there's some research uh, regarding the frescoes as well, because they really exist in the real world. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, when uh, she was uh, released by Joseph II, that technically she could leave as a free woman, did she go visit her other siblings? Uh, no, well, they were all in, in, in convents and monasteries. She couldn't do that. Oh, she but, couldn't. Uh, she... No, she could not, but uh, she, first of all, she could not, they did not just release her uh, to do as she pleased with uh, her stipend, because she was five years solitary confinement under really difficult conditions, and her temper had left her. She was by no means uh, crazy, or, uh, but she was pronounced mentally incapacitated, by the state, maybe they did not want to get all these details get out into the world. Maybe they didn't want them to become mm. public. So she barely escaped being uh, confined to a to an asylum, but she still had to live under the rules of the of the state, and she lived with a, a woman who took care of her needs uh, privately in a private apartment. Oh my God! So this is twenty first century Larry asking a question. Wait, it, <laughs> If she had a beautiful voice like that in those e- ear in those years, 
Would yes. she have an opportunity to take that singing talent and do something else with it? Or was you were pretty much confined to being in the Abbey at that point for somebody like her? Well, she would have needed more professional training. She received some in the House of the Cardinal. But also her special talent, and for the Gregorian chant, you need a rather low voice. Uh, a low set of voice. She could not have sung, and uh, she had to sing an alto. She couldn't have mm. sung any other. And uh, for that, of course, there was mainly the church, mm -hmm. the primary uh, chance. Wow, there's so much we're going to learn just from your book. Um, the book is called The Countess Choir Woman. It is written by our guest, Eleanor Cripps. Eleanor uh, sent us a copy of the book, so I'd like to, um, let's see if I can take a phone call. It looks like everything's set. So if you want to call in and ask for the book, uh, I'm not going to actually give you a, cho a choice. I'll just pick one person at random. <laughs> Six, wonderful six two two nine six two two is the number you'd need to call. Let me give this away, and then I want to wrap up the uh, interview. Um, just pick a number between 1 and 10. I'll just, uh, okay. I'll just pick one at random. Here we, go. Here we go. Good morning. You've got the book. Who's this? Uh, this is Susan. Susan, you've got the book. Do you know where we are? Yes. I do. Okay. You've got the book. It'll be waiting for you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Eleanor, is this your first book? Yes. Wow. This, this, yes, it is. This is well, I've written stories ever since I was a 10-year-old child or, or younger, but, uh, and I have many stories, but this was the first, was my first book. The other publishers are going to kick themselves. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. This, <laughs> the, you have really written a very, very well-written book. This is, uh, um, let's see, uh, I found it on Amazon, and it's available as a Kindle and a paperback. Do you have a website of your own or, or a different website you'd like to... Um, no, I'm afraid not. I'm just not a 21st century woman. <laughs> oh, you're stuck back there, huh? Okay. <laughs> I, I am a very old woman. <laughs> I love the fact, though, that she was considered part of the nobility before she and her siblings had to go into the convent because so many times we hear about the very, very poor class, but her family had money but she was still shunned by them and had to her and her siblings had to be put somewhere other than the family members to be taken care of but she was one who made who her best friends during her imprisonment or almost best friends were the lay uh, the lay uh, nuns who came from poor country families and they really were um devoted to her and uh, whatever little benefits she had usually came from them oh my wow um well you have certainly impressed us thank you so much eleanor for taking time to be with us today i'm i hope you're writing another one you got another one coming out uh, well, I have another manuscript. I don't know what I can say. Oh. oh, my gosh. And Well, nice. if you ever want to come down to Florida, it's a lot warmer here just to, like, rub it in a little bit. You might want to come in. Yeah. We would love to have you. If you're ever in this I've, area, we'd love to have you in the studio. I have been to Ocala many times. You have? What, do you have, do you have family here? No. My husband had a, a condo in Clearwater. And whenever we came up 75, we went in Ocala and had lunch there. Oh, man. Oh, you should have stopped in and said hi. <laughs> Next. Well, you didn't invite me. Uh, well, is. now you have one. You have an invitation, Eleanor. Th thank you so much for being on the show with us. Stay warm. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you. Thank all you. All right. We'll be right back.